You're listening to BQN. Assimilate the audio. Welcome to Cinema Z, a film discussion and review podcast on BQN. We're here to showcase the films you probably missed, but should definitely check out. From independent and obscure to art house and absurd, each episode will gather, perhaps cocktail in hand, to discuss it all. I'm kind of hosting, but not really. Uh, the host actually this week is going to be Laz. And uh, before we get going with today's episode, though, I would like to know... What is everybody drinking today? Let's go around. I'm drinking some water as usual. Yeah, so am I recovering from uh from yesterday, so oh, no. sticking with the H2O. Um, okay, so I listeners, as you know, I'm always very classy, so I have a red solo cup for my drink. Um, I have a mixture of something called pink Whitney. Oh, uh, it looks like it's just pink and it's got vodka in it, and something called Rosini from Trader Joe's because I just decided to mix whatever I had. Um, and it's this very healthy color of dark red. Rosini. Oh. Rosini. She's mm-hmm. a classy girl. It's very on brand. I am drinking coffee because I just woke up. Oh. <laughs> oh. Good morning. Uh, <laughs> listeners, by the way, we have we have a guest host. I, I should have... <laughs> throwing that out there joining us today is nathaniel i forgot to introduce him at the beginning my bad uh but he is a horror fan and we're very excited to have him with us today thank Yay. you thank you for having me i am ready to go how's the coffee strong <laughs> Ooh, strong, <laughs> strong oh, and like instant my coffee. Yeah. and my man <laughs> yes we like it we like an instant man yeah. oh and strong men some mask mask for mask <laughs> I also have a, a coffee mug here with a hot beverage inside, guys. So a little different this week. What's the what is the theme? What is well, you know, uh, our discussion today. We're we're going to be going deep into the woods. It's autumn. There's a rainstorm. It's cold. I I just felt like you know something a little warm. So I got myself um, apple cider and he's up and get some cinnamon in there a little bit of nutmeg and whiskey a uh, bunch of whiskey uh, <laughs> i love it let's be real <laughs> i love it <laughs> thank you guys thank you for the support <laughs> earlier listeners mark had a sweater on and it was the sweater with the coffee mug it was a very hallmark movie <laughs> so new england just very very much <laughs> just it was a whole moment well, uh, as I said, listeners, this week I'm not actually hosting. Uh, that job is going to go to Mr. Laz Marquez. So, without further ado, take it away, Laz. So, listeners, this week we are going full on horror. In previous weeks, we've gone, you know, a little bit more psychological with our films, but this time we're just going for it. So, we are covering Evil Dead. 2013. So Evil Dead is a 2013 American supernatural horror film directed by Fede Alvarez in his feature directorial debut, who co-wrote the screenplay with Rodo Sayagos, dubbed a reimagining of the Evil Dead from 1981. The film is the fourth installment in the Evil Dead film series. It stars Jane Levy, Shiloh Fernandez, Lou Taylor, Pucci, Jessica Lucas, and Elizabeth Blackmore. The story follows a group of five people under attack by deadites in a remote cabin in the woods. So before we get into any discussion, I want to start by warning our listeners, we'll be covering a very serious issue that many face, addiction. If you or someone you love is dealing with any addiction issues, please reach out to either a medical professional or call the SAMHSA National Hotline at 1-800-662-4357. You are not alone. Act 1, the beginning of real life horror. The movie begins 
after a harsh cold open with our protagonists coming together to help their friend Mia, who is a heroin addict, kick her addiction by staying at their family cabin in the woods. We meet Mia, David, Mia's brother, Olivia, a registered nurse, Eric, a teacher, and Natalie, David's girlfriend. The opening establishes that in order to keep Mia from overdosing and nearly dying for a second time, they plan to keep her there as she experiences withdrawals. Then chaos slowly begins to ensue. So I'm curious, how did everyone feel about the opening of the film, which features another female character dealing with possible possession and the characters that we are introduced to in this film? And honestly, the fact that this film gives you a proper reason for people to stay in a remote location. When I put it on, I I wasn't sure what was happening with the girl. I thought that everybody sort of around her was crazy. And I was like, oh, that poor girl. And I think that's what they want you to think, you know. And then it's sort of the bait and switch because then you realize, oh, no, she's actually she's possessed and so then you're like oh yeah like you, you gotta you gotta take care of that uh, immediately and um hats off i guess to the um the makeup artists and the uh production team for the cgi and whatever they did um because it i mean it was believable looking that the girl was getting burned alive and uh that doesn't always happen especially like horror films that i've seen usually uh they skimp a little bit especially cgi maybe not with the makeup but the cgi and uh this it looked good for this film so it did a good job yeah definitely um totally agree with all the effects really effective i think something about the effects gives me sort of nostalgic vibes in a way it makes me think of 80s horror effects except you know a little bit more sophisticated and nuanced because we have the technology so to speak um i thought it was really interesting how they introduced all the characters i kind of related a little bit not not so much but to mia's relationship with her brother um there was a moment where mia was sort of saying like you haven't been around and and she was sort of reminiscing about her mother and he you know he wasn't around while his mother while their mother was dying and i thought wow women in the family always end up with that burden of having to take care of the parent i mean i'm i'm this i'm a sister of of uh, three brothers and i related to that that like struck struck a chord for me and i'm like oh no wonder she's dealing with these issues she's got a lot on her shoulders hmm. what about you matt uh, the plot twist at the beginning for me that was a big plot twist because I I've seen horror movies but I don't normally go to them so I totally fell for the switch where I just thought this poor woman they were going to burn this woman alive she didn't do anything wrong here we go again same story here's this cult and then you just hear her say in a very pleasant voice what did she say like I'm going to kill you I can't remember just like that yeah. <laughs> I'm going to kill you all. I think it was something along the lines of like, Daddy, I'm going to rip your soul out. (laughs) Oh, yeah, that was yeah, that was it. (laughs) I mean, still very sweet, still very sweet and very kind. But, you know, I kind of said, oh, okay," And then we have the twist and then she gets burned alive. Um, So I definitely love the cold open. I think that for me, overall, the movie was a great nod to sam raimisms if i could describe it a good way it's like i call it you know when you get to see certain cinematography styles from the same director i call it like the director bukake um and this was like a nice little sam raimi kake overall this movie so i I think you created a new term director kake sam raimi kake sam rake yeah all of all of the above (laughs) What about our special guest, Nathaniel? What did you think? Well, first off, Matt, I hate you. Um, (laughs) As far as the opening of the film, I'm such a jaded horror fan. Um, It's still very effective, but it's like, yes, I didn't think that she was an innocent victim. I mean, she was an innocent victim. She was. She didn't ask to be possessed. Um, Or (laughs) I don't know. Actually, I don't know what her prologue was. I don't know. I don't know what she was doing, um, especially since later on we find out some characters do some really dumb shit. So maybe she did too. I don't know. But either way, she didn't deserve it. 
still, yes, I was kind of waiting for her to do it, but the reveal is still very effective. She's still scary. The yeah, makeup effects, great. And yes, the fire. Um, sometimes fire, I don't know, it's like it's hard to do, but it looked unpleasantly real. And then, you know, the brother sister relationship. It's always hard for me to watch any any sibling relationship really it doesn't matter if it's brothers or sisters, but when it's a brother and a sister that hits home for me. I love my sister very much. She's my best friend. So it's it's hard to watch someone struggle, um, especially Mia specifically. I mean, it's you know, I, I couldn't I don't know. I couldn't bear to watch my sister go through something like that, but um, I can definitely put myself in their shoes. It's a very tragic relationship. <laughs> So kind of jumping off of that, you know, how did we all feel about within introducing the characters? It's all really formed around Mia's addiction. They're all here because they love her. and They've been friends for so long. And that's what keeps them at the cabin. Olivia at some point says, like, we're not going to let her leave because if she does, she's going to go back to her old habits. So like, the addiction storyline did that work for you guys at least at the beginning i don't know what was wrong with me i don't know i i think it was a little subtle uh for me maybe because i didn't see the struggle beforehand or like a previous flashback or anything so i'm all like why are they trying to keep her here and i had to ask andy like i was watching the same movie as him but i guess i missed a part of dialogue or i missed something something important evidently because i i was lost and until like nobody was letting her leave i'm like why aren't they letting her leave and like and my partner andy's loves horror and he's like well she's you know an addict in the trend oh it's like oh that makes total sense but yeah maybe it was just a little subtle for me i didn't quite get uh it right at the beginning but once i understood that everything made a heck of a lot more sense and um i understood it was like compassion because when i was watching it originally i thought it was like a weird game like i thought there was like a college game that they were doing like mm. okay like we're in the spooky cabin and you know you can't get freaked out but no it's an addiction thing and they were trying to help her and it makes a heck of a lot more sense than whatever i had going on in my head so yeah my suggestion was just that that opening was just maybe a little a little subtle because i didn't i didn't pick up on it yeah, I mean, I thought it was a really interesting in for a movie like this, since we're also used to the trope of kids going up to a cabin to have fun and drink and have sex. And here they're coming up to do absolutely the opposite of that. Um, I did find it oddly affecting, even though they're all there saying how much they love her and they want to help her. They're all very kind of assholes like sort of lacking compassion. And I understand dealing with a person who's struggling with addiction can be very difficult and exhausting when you're kind of going through the same situations over and over again, but it still kind of made me be like, I don't like these people. (laughs) So that's why I didn't feel so bad uh, later on in the film. I thought it was a very interesting choice to take her to this house to let her, uh, I guess, detox for me. And maybe it's because I was watching it with my friends Michael and my friend Will, but we were looking and we were looking at the house and we're like, ah, this house is everything up to code. I don't know. Why are they here? How's that water? I don't know. The wood looks rotted. Why why are they staying in the house? I think (laughs) for me, those were like the things that stuck out first is like just I understand taking her away, but the location itself, I just felt like nothing is up to code and this house could fall in us at any minute. And I I don't know. He brings up a good point. (laughs) Why were they in the house? Like that particular house? There's something interesting. It's very close to my heart because I have had a lot of family who's dealt with addiction. So I get why they decided to go remote. So Mm -hmm. number one, you can't go out and like buy anything, right? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. once she dumps that heroin out, you can't like you can't get something immediately Mm. in addition it was their family home right so you want familiarity and you want a cooler temperature that way somebody going through detox can like just ease out of that medically was it mia's family home yeah it was mia and david's uh family home or like they bought it at some point Oh, so, so which one of their relatives was hanging corpses in the 
Well, that that's the thing. It was their their mother had passed away and it was abandoned for a really long time, which they mention in the film. OK, so at some point, somebody either broke in or used it for whatever reason, because it doesn't look new. So, yeah, it, it looks it looks aged. Yeah. Um, so I mean, so just without going too far off topic, Laz, I was curious. So you said in regards to um, in regards to detox and having some familiarity, was that like a, a, an emotional ease in, to that process as well in terms of them being at this this family home? Is that also having something familiar in the space is also an easier way to help that person come down? Is that I think in I think in general, you know, there's different techniques within that. But from what I've read, you want something familiar. You mm. want a safe space. So if Mia considered that a, a safe space for her, mm-hmm. even if it triggers, you know, like certain things, like she gets upset about like her mom or David being there, it still creates a sense of comfort. Mm. What do you think, Nathaniel? I think i totally missed i didn't realize it was their home their family home or however they came about it i thought they got it off airbnb or some terrible uh deal that they got i thought so too (laughs) i asked andy i was like is this airbnb i just couldn't imagine that being someone's family home unless you're from you know 18 i'd leave them a bad review yeah terrible this movie definitely does a lot of like plot work in conversations and these little like expositionary moments mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. if you're not like really paying attention it'll you'll absolutely miss it um because it is the very fast it was just like a throwaway line and then ultimately you end up being distracted because i think it was mia was looking through some old family photos or things and, and she was talking about it and her brother got irritated by the fact that she was talking about that and then it just became about that so yeah. it is a bit of a loose connection i will say in terms of plot but it's a horror movie so i kind of you got to forgive it because how the heck do we get these people into these circumstances yeah. um but yeah there's definitely a little it's it's a little little perforated that that I mean, whole plot line yeah. there's a little bit of um i mean you can see i think i'm assuming it's in mia's room but you can see a picture of i think their mother and the two of them Yep. up there on the wall and they i think they revisit it once or twice and you, right. you can see that i i do have to say i thought again go off of what shalmar said about really paying attention initially i thought that the brother and sister i didn't realize that they were brother and sister at mm. first i thought that they had a thing because she mm-hmm. was back she was sitting on the car she was all mopey and then he came in and he was talking to her and I thought that there was some sexual tension, and then they they dropped in the line about about being related. And I was like, "Oh, okay." Well, it doesn't help. He was a snack, so we were probably distracted by the fact that he was a snack. And I, I mean, kept waiting for his shirt to get ripped off or something. Me too. What a waste. Anyway, I know. And he is involved with the other girls. I mean, at some point, so you know, he just gets passed around. But I guess my my one little thought I had is yeah, it is a lot more believable in this version that they are there to help this young lady detox versus the uh, original movie where they're going for a fun weekend. Didn't look like a fun place to be. But so, yeah, <laughs> definitely like we're going here for serious business and it's not going to be fun. That is totally fair. <laughs> so I think we can start diving into act two which i like to call the gore and horror of it all because Mm. this film does not hold back when it comes to like gore when it comes to brutality no so after a terrifying dive into mia's experience in the woods where viewers again spoilers but she gets kind of like pseudo raped in the woods and the characters mm-hmm. s- start to realize the true nature of the situation. Terror ensues as one by one, the demon, whatever that might be, begins to attack our main cast, starting with Mia herself. She's now fully taken over, and the friends are forced to face these unknown terrors. So how did you all feel about that? Okay, so the 
the car scene where she's running away, trying to get away, and it's raining or whatever. And she ends up uh, the car. She uh, skids off the road because she sees the the figure, and she wants to um to avoid hitting a person. Uh, she ends up into the swamp. Uh, that entire sequence I thought was really well shot. It was kind of almost pretty, but it's odd saying that for a horror film. But I, I like the cinematography yeah, of yeah. the shot, uh, the fog and whatnot, and uh, they did a good job with that. And then when she escaped and she's running again, the cinematography was really well. She's like crawling into the bushes and stuff. What threw me off was, I think it's a trope of horror films. And I haven't watched a lot of horror films, but the trope of vagina possession and i brought it up with andy it's like they always go for the vag the thing's just going up her leg and it's oh it's gonna go inside where's it gonna go inside it's gonna go in her veg and i've just i think i've seen that a few times and i'm like oh my god and i told andy before it happened i was like it's gonna go in her veg he's like how do you know i was like it's gonna go up there and then it did so, so Kamala Harris that was the say, one thing i'd change you, you can Harris blame sam raimi for that by the way oh yeah because that's Absolutely. in the original, and he loves like badge. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as Kamala okay. Harris would say, it's going in the cavity. <laughs> mm. Oh my goodness! I, I think that was the first time I saw a tree rape. I think I the vaginal possession by a, but specifically by a tree. Um, so I think that I mean it, maybe it wasn't the original, but I don't remember. But yeah, um, but I want to talk really quick about the blonde guy. What was his name again? Eric. The long hair. Oh, I hate of him. Of course it was Eric. So, <laughs> you know, the one thing I love about horror movies is that I get to scream at the television and be like, no, don't fucking do it. Stop it. You idiot. I hate you. Um, and I, you know, I did that. And, uh, you know, he, because he started reading this book that was wrapped <laughs> in barbed wire, garbage cans lock and then it was like covered in like human flesh Preach. and it was like don't don't read me kill 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 you're gonna die if you read this book don't turn the page you dumb cunt like it just kept happening and <laughs> as he read the book that's when mia got the the tree rape unfortunately for her <laughs> um her performance though during oh. all of that is pretty intense and i oh, think she God. really like leans into it in a fantastic way that I just believe that it's happening and I feel mm. so bad for her. And I'm so mad at this Eric guy who you cut back to him and he's there with like, you know, he's got books and notebooks and he's taking notes and he's drawing doodles. And I'm like, oh my God, what is up with this? This guy is the worst. Like these are the worst <laughs> friends ever. Eric, Eric is like, he's the smartest, dumbest person in the movie because yeah. he can tell you all of <laughs> As he's watching everyone die one by one, as he's watching the possession happen, he can tell you this is what's happening right now. This is what's happening right now. But as he was reading the book in the beginning, he just couldn't read the, you know, the fine, not even the fine print. It wasn't like, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to ask you, do you think that he was just so compelled by this magical object to read it? Or was he just brutally curious and... You know, he's brutally because... stupid. He's a yeah. loser. Well, <laughs> it's it's a little bit of all of those things. I think you know. I think f for us to get to the point of the possession, I think he had to be. I think he had to be ignorant. I think there had to be a level of stupidity. Is that? Do I want to use that word? Yeah, I don't he's, know. He's, he's probably from Florida. You know, after <laughs> that, that book was banned. He's right. Oh. That book was oh. banned. <laughs> And we are blaming Ron DeSantis Whoops. for this vaginal possession. <laughs> you look up Florida man in the dictionary and it's that kid. It's. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, going back to the book, I just I mean, it was wrapped in barbed wire. There was skin. He didn't have gloves on. I just you could have kept hand that. sanitizer ready. Yeah, it, I had, it, was, it was not cute. It was not cute. I had questions. No, trash that whole moment. I mean, I but if you trash that moment, then the, the movie's we over. We don't have a movie. I don't know. I mean, I think that at this point in cinema history, they can come up with better reasons for people to have unfortunate supernatural phenomena happen upon them, you know? Because he, he really does go out of his way to ruin his life. And, you know, I'll give him one thing. <laughs> you know, I guess if you're just so curious, like, what is this? It's wrapped in barbed wire. How strange. You want to snip open the barbed wire and see what's underneath? Fine. But once you see what's underneath, 
you're just asking for it there's mm. too much you've you've unwrapped all these layers like Shalimar said it's like what does the book say don't read it don't no, read my it my favorite part is where he the 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 inscription is is crossed out and he's like oh wait let me get a pencil and a paper and just do the little <laughs> the old trick and then let me just read it out loud really slow he that's good was begging for you know it. it's really good casting though because tell me did he not have the most punchable face oh mm -hmm. yeah he did like the, the 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 blow the blowout and like the beard and the, the it's just come on that was a blowout that wasn't like straight yeah. hair that was a blowout i um, think i kept oh, watching so because i wanted to see him die so bad right and like and they kept and him like dangling forever. his death in front of our face i'm like yeah. is it coming next I, scene I, I think i think that's a good point to like lead into which is like the brutality starts so mia's like oh the best, god right yes she like completely like insanely pukes on Olivia. And there are chunks. It's gross. And Olivia being the only person I think who has like a certain level of logic is one of the first to go. Yeah, she was she was the most compassionate one, probably out of yes. all of them. Yeah, she didn't deserve to go first. <laughs> no. <laughs> Certainly the blowout needed to get it, but <laughs> Well, he 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 got something. He was stabbed in like his like little chest and like in the eye. I mean, yeah. we watched him get some punishment the whole movie, though. I do have to say, I mean, he yeah. he went through it. He, he deserved did. it. He. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, after the nail gun, I thought, okay, well, he's gone now. And you the know what? He came brutal. right. That nail gun was nasty. The most traumatic scene in this entire film. Was in, when they discovered the dog. Sorry, they saw. Yeah. I texted you guys. They found the dog, and I was just like, "They better not kill that dog. They better not kill that dog." And then there was a dead dog. I was like, "Mm mm mm." N -n 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 the dog's name is Grandpa. I I can watch people get their arms cut off. I can watch people's heads get smashed in, but do not hurt a dog in a no. film. I, I sorry, Agreed. cardinal rule. Agreed. Nope. Yeah, don't you kill that baby. Yeah, mm -mm. that's hard yeah. to watch, but. The dogs always go in the supernatural movies because the supernatural entity knows the dog, the cat. Yeah, they're they're more aware. So like, oh, I got to get rid of this thing. Actually, you know what? That's very interesting, though. You're absolutely right, Nathaniel. It's always like the animals. They have a special instinct where they can pick up on certain stuff. That's yeah, that's actually very true. Well, think about it. Grandpa was the one who like agreed with Mia when she was like, oh, like something smells in here. And he's mm -hmm. like pawing at the cellar. So, of course, like this entity doesn't want grandpa to, you know, be around. I'm pretty sure in uh, Secret Window, the Stephen King uh, movie with Johnny Depp, the first victim of that is also the dog. Uh, I do like that movie, but the death of the animal isn't really seen as, as gruesome as, as that. But also, it still sucks. Yeah, it happens. It happens. They did it in, um, oh, what is that movie? I hope they can talk about this, even though the strike is happening. It's the last voyage of the debt. Oh, I haven't seen that yet. My ear, Detmer. The last voyage of the D. That's just what I'm going to say. The last voyage of the D. I believe that I there is that. also a dog that gets killed in that as well. So it's just Looks a... like you're talking about something on Pornhub. <laughs> I have We're that not saved in my shame. specials. We're not here to <laughs> king shame. If I like the last voyage of the D, I like the last voyage of the D. What can I say? My bad. I'm sorry. So at, 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 right. after after that, we see, you know, after Olivia kind of goes. And again, she was probably the most compassionate, like you said, Shalimar. You know, I think that's why the entity like had to stop her in her tracks. And she like peed her pants. But then we start to get like Natalie being taunted by Mia, who's stuck in the cellar now. The effect of the pee, though, going down her leg and then it being like hot, obviously, and there's like steam coming off it. I was like, oh, yeah. that's realistic pee. That mm -hmm. looks like pee. That is what pee would do in a cold shack in the woods. Pee would behave like that. So I actually took notice of the pee. So they did a good job. It's very accurate. Again, listeners, we're not here to kink shame. And apparently <laughs> Mark has uh, some very specific feelings about urine. In all of its different states and forms and temperatures. 
It was really to be yellow, fair, though, so I don't think that she was healthy. She needed to be was dehydrated. Yeah. She was dehydrated, but it tells a lot of story. It tells that the room is cold. Mm-hmm. It tells that she's dehydrated. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's it's trying very, to get this girl detoxed. The pee, she's... the pee is working hard to tell mm-hmm. us a story. <laughs> There's always something unnerving in a movie when a character pisses themselves. Like, yeah. it's sort of this very... Um, you just really feel that and it's it erotic creeps you out no. not erotic oh. i'm not kink shaming. Just, you were That's fishing for words saying. so i i threw one out i was i was <laughs> fishing magical visceral visceral that's the oh. word i was looking for this is it's one of very... donald trump's favorite films <laughs> the pp tape um, anyway we can we, we can we should move on from the pp yes, should. <laughs> also very vulnerable i think in yes general. yes like somebody peeing themselves in bed or like in yeah. you know, in general is like super vulnerable but then we start to get as they're all figuring this stuff out we start to get again mia who's full-on possessed taunting natalie so she's like natalie um oh i'm faking it but like my leg hurts (laughs) oh my god and then natalie goes down there because she's like milk toast and like stupid i'm sorry natalie just Natalie deserved everything that happened to her. I'm sorry. I just, I have no sympathy for Natalie. I know that's cold, listeners, but I don't. I don't feel bad for Natalie. I didn't shed a tear. Not one. I support you. I do think it, uh, Natalie was the brother's girlfriend, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. I do. Why would he bring his girlfriend, who nobody knows, to <laughs> his sister's kidnap intervention yeah. in the woods? <laughs> I kind of feel bad for her. She didn't need to be there. Like, why did you bring me here? Like, I don't need to be here. I could have been, you know, with my friends having brunch and look at this shit. Well, <laughs> the most unrealistic part True. of her character is the fact that she wasn't holding a pumpkin spice latte. <laughs> in the movie. I have no Starbucks in that area. <laughs> Just like going on Google, like, ah, do you, are you getting signal? No, no. Okay. And she wasn't <laughs> snapping everything like, oh, hey, I need this on my snap. <laughs> Hashtag detox. <laughs> I'm out here helping a real friend. <laughs> hey guys, thanks for watching my channel. It's sad because I sincerely adore this film for a lot of things, but yes. she is like one of the stupidest. Yeah, she is. Like non character. <laughs> non character. <laughs> She's just like She's... 0.0 of all levels of everything. The dog was smarter. <laughs> yes. Do we have so. any other notes about Natalie being stupid? <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll speak up for Natalie. Justice um, for Natalie, Nathaniel. Justice for Natalie. Justice for Natalie. I mean, justice for all of them except for Eric. Um, you know, look, what she goes through is pretty brutal, too. I mean, once we get to, like, I don't know if I have the wherewithal to cut off my body parts because I think it's possessed or it is possessed. You know, it's a lot. It's a lot. Okay. Did she I mean, make she great did. decisions? No, she didn't no. make the best decisions. She, she wanted to be helpful, I guess. But um <laughs> it's still it's it's a lot. Poor Natalie. I'll just say that. <laughs> she didn't she didn't deserve a brutal death. Uh, she was definitely in the wrong place. And and really quick before we go down to the next act, I just want to say this group of friends don't seem to like each other very much they're all so resentful of each other i'm like you guys should have worked shit out before you decided to try and intervene on somebody's severe heroin addiction which one was the nurse the olivia she's the one who cut her face off and peed on herself Mm -hmm. the bitch face off i thought she was awful she was the worst she i mean she's a nurse she calls herself a nurse and She's like, oh, we don't need to bring her to the hospital. Nah, I got everything we need right here. I got her. And I'm like, that's the stupidest shit ever. Uh, Withdrawal uh, from heroin could kill you. Like, (laughs) but we can't apply logic to this because it it won't work. This is horror logic. It's different. A registered nurse can provide enough sustainable. Right. Yeah, in Stop. this unsanitary, a real RN would not have filled cabin. <laughs> but she was not the worst. Let's keep that for Natalie, okay? But I agree. I we got to keep it for Natalie. It Nat. Mm, mm. I'm, I'm a hold out for Eric. Still the worst. <laughs> yeah, Eric's yeah. the worst. Okay. 
<laughs> we are all in different camps and I love it. One thing I will say before we move on yes. uh, is that at this point, I was so impressed by Jane Levy's acting. Yeah. So we saw her like at multiple stages at this point, like being an addict, dealing with detox, then like being fearful. Now she's like this full blown, like evil biatch. Her acting in this film is so good. She's known for comedy, which I think is even bigger stars for her. Really? Yeah. What is, I mean, I, I don't want to go too far off uh, off topic. It just, I guess I'll, I'll look her up. I didn't know that she um, did, did comedy. Yeah, yeah she had a, a sitcom or, or something before this. And it was, yeah, she's usually like cutesy. Good for her. Yeah. So act three, I'm going to call this redemption, but thus far, I think we're all in very interestingly different camps. <laughs> but the chaos is strong with this one, and we've seen the brutality involved. But now David has chosen to find a solution by either burning everything to the ground. It's one of the ways that you can rid yourself of this demon or trying to go with an alternate route of hopefully reviving her from there we see mia's journey come to a conclusion for better or for worse so how did you all feel about like david's decision here and ultimately how mia maybe depending on how you look at it took life into her own hands or hand in the final act i think having him not burn her alive was probably good i mean it was his sister still she was possessed he really didn't want to torture um and he i guess he he was thinking that you know i could still revive her uh once i bury her alive and so that made logical sense to me but i was still at this point in the movie mad that his shirt was still on so there's that guys i'm sexy and i'm wearing a white v-neck tee you need to listen to me right now he seemed kind of like a dummy but I, I am glad that he sort of grew some balls towards the end and was trying to. I feel like that this, Eric gives him a speech at some point where he calls him a coward and calls him out and all this stuff. And I was like, eh, he's kind of right, even though we hate Eric. <laughs> um, so it was nice. It's funny. He was the one who needed the redemption as where Mia was just a victim of circumstance, victim you know, to her addiction. Yeah, and then victim to this possession, and everybody's here against Mia, and I. It's almost like you kind of take. I, I personally took a little joy in watching her like kind of tear everyone apart, um, because I'm like, you guys <laughs> were so mean to her and didn't listen to her, and I understand that she's an addict and it's hard to trust an addict, especially when they're jonesing and there's all these ridiculous circumstances. But I feel like um, I don't know I, the redemption. David has redemption for sure. Mia, I don't know what you'd call what she has. She has like her hero origin story. Like, I don't know how to, how you'd oh, call that. Oh my God. Absolutely. This was absolutely a, an origin story for, yeah. for me, in my opinion. I appreciated her, her arc towards the end. I'm probably bringing this up too early, but the nod to the, uh, the chainsaw arm mm -hmm. and how we get there at the end, nicely done in this tone. And this version uh, of of Evil Dead, nicely, nicely done, nicely brought in. I appreciated that. I think there's something to be said about even when this demon presents itself properly after she's lost everything, which is for a lot of addicts like hitting rock bottom is rock bottom. Mm. So mm -hmm. like she hit rock bottom and she has to face herself effectively. Because, like, mm. the demon takes on her face. So, like, seeing that and, like, seeing her, like, fight for her life against herself, I think, metaphorically, kind of fun. Yeah, definitely. That's really deep. I mean, eh, that might have flown over my head. I think there was a lot of blood and guts flying around. So I, <laughs> I was just like, oh, God, she's got to kill herself now. But, but that's <laughs> beautifully put. That really brings the whole theme together. Thank you for that. I'm I'm dumb. Did I watch this movie? I don't know. I must have. I think we take different things from from any sort of media. So, yeah, got it. 
<laughs> and there is a there's a lot of visual like stimulation, especially in those last twenty minutes of the movie where it starts raining blood and nail gun fight and you know all nail kinds gun of fight. <laughs> <laughs> just so much like crazy brutal thing after crazy brutal thing. Well, they um, had raining blood also in Nope, and in both occasions I got excited to see it. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> No, I just oh, it nice. visually looks cool in a horror film. I'm like, oh, it does. Cool, it's raining blood. Okay. Listeners, so I think we've confirmed that Mark not only likes urine, but uh, likes blood as well. Again, I am not here to king shame, but I just wanted to point that out. I just feel like you pointing it out is king shaming, but you know, it's neither here nor there. <laughs> I just, I feel seen. <laughs> you are seen and heard speaking of scene that last scene where she does kind of like put the chainsaw into herself a, yeah and it's kind of like a wide shot and it's like the silhouettes of the two of them and just mm -hmm. pfft, like the blood and everything that was really cool i like that part very satisfying you're like yeah fuck it <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> <laughs> kill yourself oh man kind of going back you know thematically to the film so, something that I thought was interesting is when she's ripped her arm off and all this stuff or right before she does, mm. the, uh, the demon kind of calls her a junkie. She's like, come here, you right. junkie. And what it's like, man, how much more can this woman go through? I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm a huge Final Girl fan. So if we want to, like, jump into that slightly, not, you know, a super tangent, but there's something about a strong final girl that has earned her place and like thought so hard that I think this really achieves. But I'm curious to hear about y'all and what you think. I think she's a great final girl. I have one question though. Do you think after all this, she has recovered from her addiction? Cause I feel like it could really go either way. Was this a successful intervention? <laughs> I, I would say, yeah. I mean, I do have to agree with Shalimar. It really could go either way. I mean, you know, speaking realistically, Laz, as you said, hitting rock bottom is is normally the, the moment of awakening, right? And getting possessed by a demon, losing all of your friends and your brother, I think that's pretty much rock bottom. Now, on the other hand, that could also unfortunately drive you in the complete opposite direction and further into yeah. addiction. Those things aside, she really... You know, she comes through in the end. She's has she has this great moment to me. I can't remember what the line is, but it's very like Arnold Schwarzenegger action movie one liner. I can't remember what the line was when she puts the chainsaw through through the demon's head and like rips the demon in half. Time for me to split. That what did you say? <laughs> yes. Yes. Maybe a good whatever one. it is. That's what it is. Yes. It, it's <laughs> something I'm paraphrasing, but it's something along the lines of like the demon says. I'm going to feast on your soul. And she's like, fucking feast on this. Yeah. I think mine was better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Much better. Shalimar reminded me, like saying it could go either way. I remember taking a class about drugs and just how they affect people. And I remember my professor saying like, when people try heroin, they go one of two ways, either they love it and you know that they're going to they're always going to do it or they are so scared their experience is like I'm never doing that shit again. But either way, they're they're addicted. Doesn't matter the first mm -hmm. time you do it. And that sort of reminds me of the culmination of Mia's journey. But I maybe I'll be glass half full. It's like, yes, yeah, she's she's addicted now forever, but she has completely lost everything. But she's been reborn and. Yeah, I don't I don't think she'll backslide. I don't think so. I feel like if you could survive that addiction almost would seem kind of f trivial exactly. to being yeah. tree raped. Oh, <laughs> God, I really I could have lived without that moment. You know, the vagization, the vagestin, the vagestin, the, vagest <laughs> the, vagest the, the what? Vaginal possession, vaginal possession, vagestin. Oh, I vagestin. Oh, Wait, oh, so hashtag vagestion. No. 
So Natalie's going to be like, hey guys, hashtag magician, we're out here in the woods. It's fucking dire. <laughs> oh my God. It's going to be I lit. I have to hold my phone with the other arm now because then this one's gone. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. <laughs> I wish that was a plot line now. I wish she was doing that. <laughs> I had Andy actually walk this walk through me with this because I was like, there's no way this wouldn't be on Snap. But evidently this movie was made before Snap really took off. So I was like, it's okay. It was old. So we yeah. it just missed the social media mm. renaissance. Yeah. But Natalie, oh yeah, she would have been out here mm. snapping left and right. TikToking, I mean, mm -hmm. she would have been looking for bars. They ain't have a signal out there. Probably trying to do TikTok dances with the demon. Come on, do this video really quick. She would have been walking circles around the cabin. Let's I think I have a bar. Challenge. Come on. <laughs> I'm surprised she didn't bring any sage with her. She could have just. No, I don't think she's a sage girl. I don't yeah, think she's not a... a sage girl. It was, it was a bit more basic than that. Definitely Fair a enough. PSL girl, though. Oh my god. Oh yeah. <laughs> a what? PSL, pumpkin spice latte. Oh, I'm old now. <laughs> no, he's just not basic. That's true. Laz is not basic. No, Laz is not basic at all. I I hope that's a good thing. Uh, uh, so I think we've covered most things, but I'm curious to hear each of you talk about like your film impressions maybe like some standout elements or even things that you would change about this film. First impressions, it was, it was nice to, for me to watch a film with my partner that uh, he really enjoyed. Typically when I suggest a film, he always sort of suffers through it, but I suggested this <laughs> one and he got really excited. And so mm -hmm. I was happy to make my other half happy. As far as rewrites are concerned, I think, yeah, the, the whole tree possession part, I would cut that out. And I also wouldn't kill the yeah. dog. So those are two things I would change if I was making the film. But standouts for me, uh, yeah, the main actress there, that was Mia. She did a phenomenal job, a ton of range there. Uh, they got a great actress to to be in this. Yes, um, and then, funny as it is, uh, the cinematography, I thought was, I mean, it was pretty. As a pretty film, um, I can I can find beauty in in you know things that are creepy, and um, it was pretty, yeah. So I like the cinematography as well. Awesome, I agree a lot with a lot of what Mark said. Great visuals, great uh, effects. Uh, my favorite scene, as I mentioned before, it's between the final scene where she chainsaws herself in the face, and there was this moment where she's getting the chainsaw initially she's like trapped in a little wall and she's coming after herself and i really liked like for me the climax started happening there things started picking up when she was not possessed anymore and she was just now fighting for her life i really like that uh her performance was amazing um in terms of things i would change i don't know if there's a lot to change i really always enjoyed this movie even when i first saw it again not uh horror isn't my go-to but I really had a lot of fun watching this movie. And if I were to change anything based on our conversation, I would say maybe the beginning could have done a little bit more to develop the context. Uh, even they, they actually do a really good job, but a lot of it is in dialogue. And mm. I feel like there could have been a little bit more show rather than tell for certain things. Uh, I don't know what they would be, but I think it, that would have been nice. So you could sort of reinforce what people are talking about. Um, by actually seeing it so that would be my my two cents yes i thoroughly enjoy this film full disclosure i'm not a deadite i think You're maybe that's not? what the fans call themselves no <gasps> i'm so confused that's why we brought you on i know really shock and awe nathaniel <laughs> i'll just see myself out um <laughs> The first one that I saw was Army of Darkness when I was a child. I didn't know that it was an Evil Dead movie. I just thought this was a slightly accessible horror comedy for children, not as <laughs> gruesome. And then I saw the other ones and I was like, oh, this is a, a lot of body parts going everywhere. So, I'm yeah, I'm not a, a body horror person. So it's 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 a lot to get through. And this one with ooh, modern visual effects or special effects, it's so convincing. But... I do enjoy it. I, I enjoy how they do pay 
homage to the original film and move past the limitations of what Sam Raimi had in the eighties. Cause it was, you know, an indie film doing the best they could and they, they did a great job. But so with this one, I, I love it. Jane Levy, such a surprise. This is when I really was put on to her as an actress. Cause I didn't watch a lot of her comedy. I, I knew she did comedy, but when I saw her in this, I was blown away. So I was like, well, she's doing drama and horror now, right? That's, that's what I need to see her doing and changing things. I'm not smart enough to really make a suggestion of how they could change it. But yeah, I'll never forgive Eric ever. And I know that's how he was written, but <laughs> bitch, bitch, you got a lot of nerve. Okay. If only we could have killed him one more time. One more time. That's the end credit scene. Bonus. I'm not stupid. I'm just drawn that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I, I don't know what they could do to, to move the plot along because you have to open the book and summon demons. So I just have to hate him. He he just has to be that character. That's all. But yeah, great movie. Oh yeah, and take the the rape tree out. We didn't need to pay homage to that. I agree. Um, I would definitely cut out the Vaja session, and I like the Sam Raimi Kake as well because you know you can see. I mean, uh, obviously the cinematographer. And the director were inspired by the original film because you've got those signature shots of like the weird close up of the door or the the chainsaw. But um, there's another shot that I'm thinking of that it's like uh, that tracking shot through the woods. Where yes, uh, that's it. That's it. That too. I love that sweeping very, shot. Yeah, that's you know very much the the Sam Raimi kake. Um, so I appreciate those nods. Jane Levy, I think, is definitely the strongest. I think she has the character has the strongest journey. And I think that the film, in my opinion, really rests on her. And I think she really, she carried it. She did it. And it's funny now, when I think about this movie, all I can see is red. <laughs> like that's all I see is just red. And I just think of the chainsaw to the face and how it's almost like a silhouette, right? Like you just see the red in the background, you see the house on fire, and then you just see like the chainsaw going through. And just a masturbatory, ridiculous amount of blood just gushing. Ooh. Wait, wait, Mark, wait, what was that? Why did Mark Ooh. make that noise? I'm talking about liquid. And... Oh, oh, that's right. Right. We're not here to kink shame. Mark <laughs> likes blood and piss. Gross, gross man, gross. <laughs> that's I'm not right fair, man. Down. That's not fair. Not just oh, that. Man. Mark <laughs> likes blood when it's raining blood. We have to be specific because if you just say he likes blood and piss, like that's just, he likes when it's raining blood and mm. piss that tells a story. Like, let's be yeah. specific. Otherwise, <laughs> you have to go to a doctor. Right. Yeah. It's, it is, it's it blood the and piss. Hopefully, two can bind. Because that's. <laughs> oh, no. Definitely. No, no, good. Blood and piss under very specific circumstances, we have to. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, think I've said word. enough. I've said enough. Yeah, I, I think I echo pretty much everyone's sentiments on this. I think overall, I chose the film, so I have a certain bias, but I think that it's a really powerful film in regards to having a metaphoric purpose hmm. while also being horror and like unapologetically horror. Oh, and yeah. That that's really yeah. like tough to balance in general. Uh, I think the only other person I can think of that has done that properly is someone like the late Wes Craven, where he's very academic about his approach to his characters, to the villains, and how it all coalesces together. The standouts, like we've been saying, Jane Levy, Matt, you mentioned, this film would not work if she didn't put like a bazillion percent into that performance. Yeah. Which, reminder folks, sag is still on strike. And this is why we need actors and actresses and strong performances. Because otherwise, our horror films will not work as well as this one did without someone like Jane Levy. In regards to rewrites, I would agree with what Shalimar mentioned. I would have probably removed the beginning because I don't think it adds any value to the rest of the film. 
I think it's like a, an appetizer to kind of like rope people in, but it doesn't factor into anything else after that. Yeah, it almost kind of like spoils the movie in a way. Yeah, because it's basically tells you what's going to happen, which I, I've seen other movies that do that, but they do it much, much less on the nose, perhaps. And then who are all these people? It was kind of like super disconnected, I think. It was a cool scene. I couldn't help but laugh for some reason. What? Some, just laughing when she's like, Daddy, I'm going to take your soul. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> the only other thing I, I, I would change is probably a, let's just send Natalie to go get some pumpkin spice lattes and like let her exit the entire film. And she comes back just in time for the raining blood. She's like, oh no. Oh no, what did I miss guys? Oh. <laughs> Are you guys seeing this? Oh, let me turn on my live stream, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> now what's just sort of disappointing because when I watched like Exorcist, there's like a line in the Exorcist that I can't get out of my head. And I was hoping for one of those because it's another possession film. Yeah. But like in the Exorcist that, the girl she's like what's that matter priest don't you want to fuck me anymore and ever since i first heard that i've i've never been able to get it out of my head and occasionally i just yell at andy what's the matter priest don't you want to fuck me anymore you know <laughs> um i am getting a, and, a, yeah. a good view into your sex life this yeah. is really like... yeah like we we've covered a lot of <laughs> your thinking here we've i don't feel There's... ashamed though no, Shouldn't. you're not shamed. We are not, not here to no. kink shame, That's listeners. Great. We've unpacked a lot today. I've actually never seen The Exorcist. I know, no. shame on me. Shame on you. We'll shame you. <laughs> so with that, I don't know that director's cut is necessarily needed for this, but I have some scenes uh, that we can recite. No, let's go. Let's go hog. Let's act it out. Like usual, listeners love it. We love it. Let's play. <laughs> and now we're pleased to bring you our feature presentation. Okay. Uh, scene one, bedroom scene with Mia and David pre-possession. Who wants to play David? Who wants to play Mia? I'll do Mia. Do David. Should I just jump in? Action. Mia, listen, you got to get out of these clothes. Go take a shower. David, please, please, you have to get me out of here. Mia, look, nobody said this would be easy, but... No, you don't understand. There was something in the woods. David, and it's... I think it's in here with us now. With me in the room. Look, you know it's all in your head. Just try to get it together. You'll feel better tomorrow, okay? You'll be glad we were such assholes. Okay. Cut. Fun fact, this is one of my favorite scenes in the film because Jane Levy kills it. And yeah, she does. Even with her like weird tongue out speaking stuff, her like tonation and like the pacing, like so good. Okay, scene two, Natalie meets the new Mia. Natalie. You're Natalie? Mm-hmm. I can see the pumpkin spice latte in hand. <laughs> I, I could do I could do me I could do me again unless somebody else wants to go. I'll I'll, I'll do me at this time. Okay. Action. Natalie? Mia? Natalie, what am I doing down here? My leg hurts. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come down there, okay? Why did you lock me down here? You were supposed to help me. <laughs> we're trying to help you, okay? <laughs> But you got a little out of control, Mia. You got violent, and we didn't know what else to do, Mia. Um, I, I, I think somebody, something really terrible has happened, and we have to get out of here now, okay? You don't understand. He's not gonna let you leave, and he's not gonna stop till he has you, until he has all of you. Cut. That was amazing. Thank you, Les. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. Oh. I really had to use my guttural throatness. Oh, it's, it's scene three. David and oh. Eric connect over the dead. Who wants to play David and who wants to play Eric? I will play Eric. I will be the hero that Gotham doesn't deserve, but the hero you that shuts your mouth. 
You shut your mouth. <laughs> I feel like this should come full circle and Nathaniel should play uh, David then. I'll do it. <laughs> Action. Are you sure this will work? If we by killing my sister, she'll be at peace. Am I sure? Am I sure? Of course I'm not. It's not a science book. Look, I'm sure of one thing. Whatever is inside me is the cause of all of this. If she dies, then this thing is going to die with her. What if she just lost her mind? What if she needs a doctor? What? A doctor? My mom died in a mental hospital. She was crazy. She was deranged. She was a monster. I've always feared that me and Mia would end up like her. No, you're just a fucking coward. You know exactly what we have to do, but you're too scared to go through with it. I'm going to burn this fucking place down. I'm going to end this nightmare. Why don't you just run away? Go behind some rocks somewhere. You know what? You're, you're great at that. Cut. Damn. Eric, you got a lot of nerve, bitch. Whoa. <laughs> oh, Matt, that was so good. I want to punch you in the face. It's crazy. <laughs> do you, do you want to shoot me in the face with... A nail gun? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> and, and then hit you with a crowbar. <laughs> yes, and then light you on fire. If they're not doing that, listeners, it's not love. I'm just going to say that right now. <laughs> not here to kink shame. Are you going to pee on them to make the fire go out? I'm just asking. Maybe. Asking for a friend. Maybe. <laughs> well, now. Trivia. All right. Although he has a background in CGI, director Fede Alvarez chose to go with practical effects for the film's visuals, mainly out of tribute to what Sam Raimi achieved on a very limited budget back in 1980. While it paid off, I always appreciate Absolutely. practical effects. Very well done. According to reports in the press, the film used 70,000 gallons of fake blood. In an interview, Fede Alvarez said they used 50,000 gallons for the final scene alone. This is compared to the 200, 300 gallons used in the original. 95% of the remake was shot in chr chronological order. This was done because a lot of the film takes place in a controlled environment and the level of blood and violence gets worse and worse as the film progresses. By shooting in order, the filmmakers could throw blood on the walls and not worry it would mess up another shot where it needed to be clean. When producer Rob Tappert suggested the possibility of an Evil Dead remake to Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell, Raimi responded the most favorably, favorably whereas Campbell was the least enthusiastic of the three. Raimi thought that the Evil Dead 1981 was the, exactly the sort of film that could be successfully updated and reimagined by a new generation of filmmakers, while Campbell was not happy to pass on his iconic role of Ash. He relented when he heard the film would feature a new set of characters and the role of Ash would not be recast. When the broken necklace is found outside of the cabin, it can be seen resting in the shape of a skull, just like in the original, The Evil Dead. Okay, so final thoughts. Out of five nails into the face, how would you rate this one? I'll give it five nails. I think... Um... Critiques aside, it's a fun horror romp. And for what it is, I think it is amazing for the category it's in, the type of movie. And um, it's a horror movie that I can actually watch over and over again and have fun with. So I'll give it five nails to the face. For me, I think I will give it two nails to the face. You guys know I'm not a horror fan. Uh, this is so far of, of beyond my uh, comfort zone. <laughs> Uh, as far as what I would watch for a film, my partner loved it. And like I said, uh, cinematography was great. There was some great acting in it. Will I watch it again? Probably not. Uh, but there are there are positive things about this film. Just for me, uh, I probably wouldn't rewatch. So for me, it's a two. Two nails to the face. This is also not my go-to type of movie. I adore everyone on this pod, and I will watch scary films for you guys. I want to make that very clear because I love you guys. <laughs> so I will do this. I will give it because it was still a fun watch and it was fun to to watch with the people that I watched it with. Um, I'll give it a four out of five. I still haven't quite forgiven Eric and I don't know if I ever will. So I think that's just the one thing that stands in my way of giving it a five out of five. Let me give it four out of five. I will definitely give it five. I'm not 
a huge fan of the original, even though I appreciate it. But for this one to come along and update it and still respect the original film, I just really enjoy it. I mean, I don't love watching body parts go everywhere. That's a lot. But I still think that it's a brilliant horror film. And again, shout out to Jane Levy. You know, some actors shy away from horror, but horror films are dramatic acting. If you want to be a good actor, do a horror film because you have to work really fucking hard. And for some reason, people don't think, I don't know, they, they get confused. They they think all horror movies are like D movies or something. So if you're a good actor, you can do horror. So five for me. Thank you for saying that because it's very true. I'm going to give it, I'm going to shoot myself in the face with 10 nails for this one because I did it and I'm allowed. (laughs) I think in regards to horror, it, uh, it definitely achieves and succeeds in its mission statement while also telling a very deep story. So I will take one to the face for this one. (laughs) Matt, you just, you need to get laid after this is done. I am wholesome. <laughs> I am so wholesome. I have no idea what you're talking about, Nathaniel Nunez. I bet you are. What shows are on BQN, you ask? Well, here's a rundown of some podcasts you might be interested in. All Good Things, a Star Trek Universe podcast covering all of Trek, hosted by Amy, Mark, Christos, and Kelvin. Bargain Bin Gamer, a YouTube show hosted by Davey, a self-proclaimed gamer who specializes in reviewing and showcasing affordable video games. If you're lost in the Delta Quadrant, check out The Captain's Couch, a Star Trek Voyager podcast hosted by Jeremiah sitting on Janeway's ready room couch. Cinema Z, a film discussion and review podcast showcasing films you probably missed but should definitely check out. Hosted by Mark, Matt, and Laz. Beam Aboard the Galaxy Class, a Star Trek Next Generation podcast covering all of TNG. Hosted by Amy, Joe, Rhea, and Kevin. History with the Zilagis, a snippet of historical events from around the world. Hosted by Chrissy and Jason. For the newest Trek coverage, check out Infinite Diversity. Hosted by Chrissy and Thad. Test your Trek knowledge with Trexperts Quiz, a Star Trek quiz show hosted and written by Davey. Union Federation, covering all things Star Trek and the Orville, which we all know is really a Star Trek show. Hosted by Kyle, Kevin, Amy, and Haley. Spill the tea with What's the Tea, Bev? A Trek current events and fan interview show hosted by Christos. And for our Patreon members, we have The Hive Mind, BQN's monthly roundtable discussion with hosts and listeners. It's Green, a cornucopia of topics hosted by Mark. And Amy's Math Moments, a quick look at math moments in Star Trek, hosted by Amy. We know you have a choice of podcasts to choose from, and we thank you for listening to BQN. Assimilate the audio. I'm curious, though, Mark, what are we going to be talking about next week? Oh, my Lord. We're getting a <laughs> double dose of the D uh, next pod, <laughs> guys. Uh, maybe triple D. Uh, oh, we're doing oh the Dueling Dunes double feature. Uh, so this is something we've on the back end here been talking about for a little while. Uh, but we're going to bring it uh, next episode where we are going to be covering... Uh, Two movies. So this is something we have not done on this pod yet. So this is brand new for us. Uh, and we are going to be comparing and contrasting and uh, talking about uh, the 1984 David Lynch Dune, as well as 2021's uh, Dennis Villeneuve Dune Part 1. So I'm very excited for this. The spice is life. <laughs> <laughs> so, Les, where can people find you when you're not being held captive by your friends oh my word well when i'm not being held captive because of my rotten soul i am on social media instagram twitter blue sky threads you name it at las marquez 
L-A-Z-M-A-R-Q-U-E-Z. If you're interested in seeing a lot of my horror works that I've done officially for a lot of studios, you can find me at www.lazmarquez.com. So, Nathaniel, where can people find you when you're not running around in blood rain? Well, if I'm not snipping through razor or put a wire that I'm not supposed to be, you can find me at Nate His Fate on Instagram. That's pretty much the only place I'm active. Everything else is the same, but I'm never on. So, Mark, where can people find you on social media and the like when you're not sawing your body parts away? Well, when I'm not sawing my body parts off, but only like the rotten limbs. Okay. So when I'm not doing that, people can find me in the BQN Collective Facebook group. Uh, they can also find me on All Good Things. It's a podcast I host uh, about Star Trek. Uh, we cover the entire Star Trek franchise. Um, also, I have a show, It's Green, on um, to become a patron of the network on Patreon. And I'm on Blue Sky, so you can find me there. <laughs> and Shalimar, where can people find you when you are not uh, locking Natalie in the basement with a possessed Mia. Well, I mean, that's usually every Tuesday and Thursday, but you could find me uh, usually on Instagram at Shalimar Lewis, uh, S-H-A-L-I-M-A-R-L-U-I-S. And you can also find my artwork and design work at ShalimarLewis.com and ShalimarLewis.art. So, Matt... Where can people find you when you're not singing in the bloody rain? Uh, when I am not singing in the bloody rain, you can find me on uh, Instagram on at 1701BLERD. That's my Instagram for my web series. It's about a gay black nerd that uses Star Trek to cope with life. Uh, you can also actually see Nathaniel in the third episode, um, which is coming out soon. He plays a character in the third episode. And you can also find me on YouTube because that's also my handle on YouTube as well at 1701 B L E R D. Slide in those DMs. Say hey, but don't piss or bleed on me. <laughs> I thought we were in kink shaming. We're, we're not. Just... We would love to hear what you thought of today's episode and hope you'll join our Facebook group at the BQN Collective to continue our discussion there. You can also send your thoughts to at CinemaZPod on Twitter and Blue Sky. And let us know if you'd like to recommend a film. Please follow the network on Twitter, Blue Sky, and Instagram at BQN Podcasts. Please hit the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a star rating and written review. That helps others to find the show. You can also follow the entire network's podcast with our master feed by searching BQN. At this time, we'd like to thank our associate producer, Amy Nelson, and a special thanks to Laz Marquez for our artwork each and every week. The opening and closing music for this podcast is titled Dancing Dead and was provided by Ketza from the Free Music Archive, providing royalty-free music for content creators. If you'd like to help us keep all our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. We will add you to the Hive Mind Facebook group so you can enjoy its green, Amy's math moments, and other network books. With a monthly subscription of $5 or more, you can join our meetings on the Hive Mind Roundtable discussion on the second Saturday of each month. Visit patreon.com slash BQN to get all the details and watch your messages. Thank you for listening. We hope you'll tune in next time. shower in some blood and piss <laughs> Jesus. you too yeah do you want to shower together oh dude yeah save water Filthy. Right. <laughs> I, like it. I don't know that this is like a director's cut you know reenactment kind of episode but you guys let me know I mean, listeners, I, I do just want you to know that um, the person hosting this podcast of Cinema Z uh, actually had the opportunity to go to Tish 
Tisch School of the Arts, one of the, the great acting academies of uh, the United States and turned it down. Um, wow. I just thought that I'd put that out there, listeners, before we potentially go into the director's cut scenes. You, you know, you know, Matt, every time you mention that, I've cut it out of the pod. I don't even include it. But you keep Do you it really? <laughs> Do you not listen to your own podcast? I've <laughs> never included it. I always cut that out. <laughs> He's trying to wear you down. One of these days you'll keep it in. Right, right. Okay. Sure. <laughs> 